if you're an intermediate painter and you're happy with the results you're getting but you want to improve you should do this it kind of forces you to have to 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 learn other things or to paint a different way i definitely had this it's like i was painting marines forever and that was like the first thing i painted and i was doing it for a long long time and i felt pretty confident at doing it but then the second you gave me a model that wasn't marine it was like i was a beginner again that is how you hit those plateaus because you're just doing the same thing and expecting to just magically get better just by the fact of doing it over and over that style massively adds to a nasa size rocket booster to your brush control it's not an opinion it's not my opinion or george's opinion or whatever the more times you do that it will make you better what do you think of the previews very good super excited uh there's a lot of, of spicy stuff in there which uh which I'm, I'm i'm dead keen for we'll go through them like one by one but is there only like immediate like i'm gonna definitely paint that night lords kill team all day long yeah. twice on sunday <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're um, not uh you're not really known for your chaos I fandom i had an iron warriors army i'll have you know and i'm 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 yeah, like I've, 20 I've been, years ago it wasn't that long. Uh, I know I'm, I'm, I'm a bit, a bit of a, a vintage gentleman, but but uh, I'm, I'm not that old, George. Like you know, um, uh, no, the yeah, the Night Lords uh, kill team. I am uh, very very keen for it. Um, I think it's it is everything that you, that Night Lords fans have been wanting for for a long time. I think it's yeah, it's. Is it just an upgrade, Spree, or is it like I'm not sure? I, and I just want to say this, I. I have no idea at all whatsoever. All I know is the models look absolutely mega. Um, yeah, they're so, painted really well as well. Yeah, yeah, they they look. In my um, usual, uh, whenever there's a new reveal, I'm like, oh, that model's cool. Oh, look how it's painted. Yeah, that's always my yeah, uh, that's yeah. always my focal. Guy focal with the lightning point. claws is 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 pretty good. I'm not gonna lie, he's uh, he looks rather hungry. He's got a mu just he's got muzzle like, on. He's got a muzzle. Like, I'm hmm. speculating, but I do feel like that is the existing. Chaos Marines, because I recognise the it, legs. It, it potentially will be. I mean, if you think of it, the the other Chaos uh, one that was done recently, I think it was a Black. It was just Black Legion, wasn't it? But mm. that was an upgrade sprue as well. But I think there's the thing is, is that I think they're very clever with the way they've designed uh, the Chaos Marine uh, new t uh, squad because a lot of the things lend themselves quite nicely to different uh, different legions really well. So, for example, like. The legs, if they're stock legs from the Chaos Space Marine kit, a lot of them have got tabards and stuff like that, which can easily be rendered as 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 skin or flesh, you know. So that's how I sub I, they've been, you know, they've been changed quite nicely. So by the looks of it, you get the lightning claws, you get um, you get man on a stick, man um, on a stick, it's man skewered on a cow stick, man on stick. Yeah, all right. Actually, it's not a man; it's another Space Marine. He's, he's so nails. He's carrying another marine. He's <laughs> <laughs> like, he's like he's, that's up there with the uh, was it waiting for a cab pose? That yeah, was your last one. Sword yeah. raised. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, man, uh, you got marine on the stick or half marine on the stick. Um, lightning claws are pretty cool. And uh, the champion looks great. The uh, the uh, champion with the flesh cape, uh, the obligatory night lords flesh tabard or flesh cape, um, is 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 pretty good. Uh, and you and you also get uh, an Astraman chain glaive as well, which looks absolutely savage. I don't know if there's like options in the kit or not, but uh... I was looking at all the parts, and it looks like there's quite a few, quite a few sort of extra bits. I'm going to say though, as much as I love it, and wrapping wrapping your chain sword in a skeleton is very very Nostraman. <laughs> it does reduce the functionality of the uh, like of the chain sword a little bit, you know. You only got the the I'm getting flashbacks to you moaning about the cape setting on fire. I'm just the, uh... saying that you know like if I'm if I'm getting 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 Queensby rules with another space marine like I want my chain sword to have all the teeth, not not half of it. <laughs> all the teeth. I didn't think about that actually. I'm missing yeah. a few teeth. Yeah. yeah. Like it's, you know, like um you could probably, I mean, if you lamped someone in the face with just that big hunk of metal, though, it's probably going to... Yeah, I, I, I'm going to go down the route of it's decorative rather than functional. Like uh -huh. um, like but, most but, of the stuff you see <laughs> on the being honest. Like, yeah, yeah, but, um, but no, the, uh, yeah, they're, they're great. I think that um, they're, they are probably uh, like one of my favourite things. There's quite a few things from this preview, which... Um, which yeah, we'll skim, we'll skim through some of the stuff. Uh, you've got the new, uh, new Necron Oracan. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Absolutely love it. I love the use of color as well. I love the green and purple. Color. See, like I say, go back to how they painted, man. It, they, it, it's a really solid, solid paint job. Like, um, obviously, I'm not sure who done it from the EM team, but um, whoever did it, they, they knocked it out of the park like Babe Ruth. Like, um, yeah, really, really great. Um, the, the colors on it are brilliant. I love the the sort of the almost the um, the way that you got the armored areas that that lovely sort of like bluey green, and then all the vibrant 
the sort of neon green is all the sort of the, the orbs and the little power nodes and things like that. They're really cool. Um, he's got he's got a cheeky little tail as well, a che- cheeky little yeah, I know me- metallic tail. Yeah, it's like cool. the spine, like sort of character. It just keeps going. Doesn't yeah, it? it's yeah. really really cool. Um, and I, I, do you know what the headdress on it is? Probably one of my favourite bits as well. I mm. think the headdress is quite cool. And then uh, Flesh Eater Quartz is obviously getting uh, getting realised with some more models. Uh, I often say about Age of Sigma models absolutely blowing 40k models out the water sometimes, and this model is one of those. Like, I, this is nuts. This is the new. I, I don't know. Say, is it Ashuran? This I, is. I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce. It I want that. I literally want that model just for the base to do like a scene on that base. Base is the base is sick. Yeah. Um. I've got to say though, I'm all about the little details. He's got this like crazy, crazy, awesome head crest, like the massive mace staff thing. But then he's got a best mate. Have you seen it? Seen the close-up photo of the face? With, with, he's got like a best mate that's like molded to his chest. So oh he's, yeah, in the, he's, got, in the... he's got. I don't know whether that's just a head. Or no, no, it's no. Like there's if, some like if, you can see his hand. So like in the in the fur like cape draped over his shoulders. There's like two little like sort of. Well, there's more than two. There's quite a lot of like think, faces. I like, genuinely think that's someone hiding from him that's pretending to be like a dead person in the cape. Like, I, I don't know how I didn't notice this. I saw the skulls and stuff, but there's actually, yeah, there's loads of like ghoulish sort of faces uh, living in there. Yeah. Yeah, that's it, proper creepy. It's, huh? it's pretty grim dark. Uh, it's yeah, that model's grim. nuts. It's really cool. Like the head, yeah, look at the photo. Look, he's got best mate. Yeah. Like, it's, okay. it's really, yeah. It's, uh, it's really good. And and I, I think as a painting piece, it's quite interesting because you've got loads of different things on there to actually add. Like, that looks stressful to paint, I'll be honest. That's, uh, that's that would... We're going to talk about it later in this episode, but that is the sort of thing that will throw me right out of my comfort zone. We're going to come back to that's, that. That's one to, one yeah. to pick up. Uh, there's another one for this as well. Uh, the Crypt Guard. Yeah, these are really cool, actually. Um, I Look thought, at the drum. Look I know. That. I was going to say, the, the amount of effort that's... And, and is he using? What is he actually using to hit the drum? I think it's a torso, isn't it? It's it's definitely some sort some of some kind uh, of fleshy sort implement, of limb fleshy yeah. implement yeah yeah the, look how the, that that's like just look at the skin on that the drum how that's on the drum skin is yeah. absolutely it's amazing unbelievable. yeah it's really cool like uh, it's little things like that that add so much interest to a model and like I, you know like other other people might potentially just paint it as the skin or thing but adding the I that, spoke that, before about like the thing that blows my mind with the heavy metal team is like if I was given a model like that like there's no reference to draw from, right? Like no, you're no, coming exactly. up with the concept. I would not in a million years have thought of that. Like regardless of how well I could paint that drum skin, I would not have thought to do that. It I think there's a little, a, little bit, a little bit of steering because like, it, because of what he's holding as like the, 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 the drum hammers. I suppose so. But right. it's just, so, it's not just like blood splatter. Like it's such a detailed Splat. impression of that. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I don't know how else to word that, but yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. These, these are, these are fantastic. Yeah. I thought they were really cool. Pretty exciting range, it looks like. I love the banner as well, the, the torn flesh. I thought that was a lovely uh, bit of detail. Yeah, what else have we got here? We've got uh, some uh, some more love for the Horus Heresy as well. Right, here we go. Here we go. They look good. They look good in Sons of Hor- Horus Blue or Green, whichever whichever you think that colour is. Stick it in the comments. Um, You're going to throw some of these in with your Blood Angels? They look, they're going to look 10 times better in red. I'm just going <laughs> to say that. Yeah. So well, this uh, is a divide, actually, because your uh, Horus Heresy Army's Blood Angels and mine is Sons of Horus. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, I. I genuinely think these are really cool. Um, and and the reason I like them is because it's nice to see that a lot of the things that were Forge World that were obviously resin are now translating obviously to uh, to, to plastic. So hopefully fingers crossed. The poses crossed. are like really dynamic as well of the Corvus armor. They so are, like yeah. we spoke about funny enough in the same thing with the 40K models, the new uh, jump pack intercessors. Yeah, like yeah. potential for swapping legs and torsos for trying to have more varieties. Well, they've kind of done it in this kit. You've got some static legs and then you've also got legs that look like they're running or about to jump or things like that. You you know, I think it's really cool the way that you can vary a unit by the the, legs sometimes do make or break a model with regards to the pose. And like, I think it's, um, you know, I think it's nice that they've actually done that. The jump packs also just massive. Like these look, these look tremendous. I've painted one of those, I think already on um, the Blood Angel uh, Heresy character that I ages back. I've forgotten his name. Uh, Zephron? Uh, 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 Zeph- Zephon. Zephon. Yeah, Zephon. That's it, yeah. Yeah, Zephon. Close enough. Okay. Yeah, close enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, no, they're good. They're great. Some additions to uh, the Underworlds models as well, which I still haven't picked up. I keep on meaning to do this. Death but, Gorge, uh, yeah. Yeah, for the Death Gorge, this is some new uh, some new Auric War Clans models. Look at this geezer. That actually reminds me kind of uh, of Azog from uh, from The Hobbit. The one and only Excellent. Defiler. Yeah. yeah but yeah. Uh, just something about like the face. Like, yeah, it's kind of definitely. like a similar sort of look. It's yeah. like someone's given him the instrument and just gone here. You have to carry this. We're going to, <laughs> we're going to wrap it around you so you cannot take it off. 
Um, but no, he's awesome. Yeah, he's he's really cool. Yeah, cool um, matches for them. Yeah, they were good. In terms of box games, uh, Necromunda getting some love as well. With, I, uh, I, do you know what? Like, uh, yet another race car for, <laughs> for yeah, Warhammer. But this is this is actually uh, a vehicle that we've seen previously. So this used is to it? be yeah yeah. So it's not a new, brand new vehicle. So this is um, uh, this is from the Elysian Drop Troops. Probably one of my favourite Imperial Guard regiments that used to be on Forge World. This is actually one of the vehicles that they right. used that they used to have. It's a new model, though. It's a new model. It's a plastic version, which is really exciting, actually, because um, again, the inner inner Imperial Guard fanatic of mine is 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 screaming when I saw this, going, "Please, please, let's get plastic Elysians in the future," because these were the, these are the vehicles that the Elysians used to use. They they kind of used to drop in with them, which is this quite is cool. screaming for an orc conversion. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that would be brilliant as a as an orc uh, buggy or truck. Because they've got all like the the buggies now that are kind of yeah yeah similar vein yeah yeah, yeah but it's a great great little kit. Uh, well, we save the best till last, obviously. Uh, I'm going to say it right now. I absolutely absolutely love this because it nods so hard to the original artwork. Um, and you know what I'm like about artwork and models. You know, I love a model that is is drawn from artwork and. Uh, this this guy is just absolutely mega, uh, and also the smoke is optional, which is which is I think a really good. Uh, I still don't know how I feel about it. If I'm completely honest, I feel like this is one of those models where like when I see it in hand, it's probably going to make sense. But I'm glad the smoke is optional. I'll be honest, because stuff like that isn't really my bag. Um, I think for me, it's just uh, I, I like painting armor. This is like mostly clothed over. That probably isn't the model for you then. No, George. it's not uh, really like he's, not really calling me. I'll be honest. He's he looks like he's wearing a lot of, a lot of robage. You know, he, he he should be at a spa, not um not on the forty k battlefield. But um, but no, he's he looks he looks he looks great. What do you think of the helmet? Uh, I like it. I, I, do you know one thing I really liked is that obviously the original artwork um by Mark Gibbons has got the the hood over the over the head. So to actually see what what the helmet looks like without the hood, it's quite cool that they've done that. They're given the option to have, have either or. Um, but I, I do, yeah, I really, really like both versions of it. I can definitely see people using the robed one on the model and then that head making its rounds on different models and yeah, uses as a conversion that. part. I think that's great. The, the smoke as well, like we always say this, like um you'll see a model with a preview image of it or from one angle or a certain angle and then you'll form an opinion based on that and then when you see it in 3D as a physical thing it's like totally different and I think I think that'll be very much the same I think that you'll see it and I think there will be oh I understand why now works I mean even even looking now we went between the front on image to the side image the side image really does show as well yeah. to see how, how how the smoke works it's definitely like model. it's definitely like quite a unique model as well yeah 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 like it's going to yeah. stand out yeah um, got to say it's always it, good I, I'm loving the sword the sword is mahoosie. It's also painted so well. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's quite that. tasty, that. Oh Let's boy. move on then. Oh, boy. Then the Deathwing, uh, what are they called? The Deathwing Knights? Deathwing Knights, yeah. Yeah. At first, I was like, oh, not too sure because... Right, this is, the one, this is the one that confuses me because I've heard a lot of people being like, oh, I'm not too sure on these. And these, to me, are an absolute home run. Like the, the, They've the only, smashed these. No, no, they look phenomenal. The only reason why I was a bit like, oh, nine out of ten is because... I think Terminator armor and what they, what they've done with uh, with Terminators and keep them obviously that iconic thing that they are. Um, the original helm is like that nods right back to my early days of Space Hulk, like back in the day. Like you know, I understand why they've done it because it's it more, still it's a, looks, more, it's a more knightly kind of helm. It still reads that. as a that. Terminator helm. No, of course to it me, does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm not. I'm. I just for me, I, I think that's like one of the most. Of an, a Terminator in itself is extremely iconic, but I think the helmet is one of the most iconic parts, personally. Like you know, but um, but it fits with them because they're knights, um, so they've got a slightly different look to the armor, which I think is good. Um, These are fantastic. Yeah, they are good. Yeah, they are really, really good. He, Lots of the, options the advancing as well. one looks amazing. Like honestly, that you would not want to meet him down Dark Alley. Like, yeah, they all um, look great. Yeah, he's uh, he's pretty good. I like the little notches on the sword as well. I think that's quite cool. The little wings, winglets on the on the sword blade. Um, that's quite cool as well. A uh, little extra little detail there. But yeah, uh, these would be fun to paint. It's kind of like um, they're kind of like blade guard terminators almost. Really, it's kind of yeah, a yeah, they are. For me. Yeah, well, they're keeping that knightly thing, aren't they? I think that these should these would look great with Lionel Johnson. Obviously, he's got a sword and shield, doesn't he? And to have, imagine imagine five of these or ten of these around Lionel Johnson. That'd be uh. The new Terminators are pretty big as well, so yeah. yeah. Well, they're still on forties, so yeah. they, you can they, they, you can see they comfortably fit on a forty. You've got a little bit of of, of basically the side of the foot, but um, it's pushing it for a forty. <laughs> yeah, but, um, but no, they look grand. Yeah, these are nuts. Yeah, love them. 
good reveal, I think. More yeah. stuff than I was expecting actually going into the weekend. I was really, do you know what? I was really like there. I was really pleasantly surprised by all the stuff that came out. I like there's there was a nice thing for ev- like for a lot of different game systems, which I mm. thought was really good. Um, yeah, but I, I've got to say it, the, uh, the the Night Lords take it for me. I think they're my favorite thing. Yeah, can't disagree. If you're a fan of the podcast and want to support the show, then what better way than with our exclusive Siege Studios merchandise? We have a bunch of high quality apparel available, as well as an assortment of painting accessories and equipment to help you while you paint. Head to siegestudios.co.uk forward slash shop to order now. Moving on then. Personal hobby, been up to much? Absolutely zero. Yeah. Um, Ironically, I painted a Dark Angel the week before the Dark Angels reveals, not knowing. That was just... Ships in the night, that one. Yeah. Just happened to... Uh, didn't even see the other ship. No, right, didn't even see, no, no, didn't know that was coming. No. Um, um, speaking of, right, I'm, I'm, this is this is blown my mind. The amount of people that called me out in my own personal private comment section on Instagram for the base room thing that is still going on. I painted a Dark Angel. I put a Steel Legion drab base room on it, as I tend to. And I've got, comment, I've got comments from the podcast listeners coming at me for my base room choice. Team Black Base Rim, we did it. We did it. Keep going. Keep every 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 Steel Legion drab base rim. You this see, is harassment. He's got it. You've got to comment. This is yeah. harassment at this point. Yeah. Um. Yeah. No, they're pretty funny. <laughs> it's, I can't believe it's transcended into we, into we, my own thing. You, you will become one of one of Team Black Base Rim eventually. Oh, but I said this to Joe. Like I painted it with a black base rim, and I didn't like it. It takes time to to get used to it to settle. No, you gotta you gotta let I'm it settle. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. <laughs> I've yeah. made it this far. I feel like I've got to like double down and die on this hill now. I think you're going to be one of the only ones, George. <laughs> Do you know what probably doesn't help myself is when I, I photograph models on a white background and it like, I, I guess I can kind of see it in that context, but uh, you know, on the table in my cabinet. Oh, he's, can... he's warming to it, everyone. Well, he's warming to it. We'll, we'll convert him slowly. It's fine. Yeah. Not too sure on that. Um, <laughs> Luton was on the show. He was. Yeah. It was great to have him on. Um, yeah, so yeah, really good timing. Obviously. A few of you might have seen it. It's yeah. only been one of the best performing videos yeah, on the it's channel. It's done very well. Yeah, yeah. it's done very well. It's really good to have him on. Like, um, we've obviously worked with him for a very long time. And uh, how did you like come about you two? So he you? actually came on one of our painting clubs. He came on an EMC at Element. Um, did you know he was coming on? I I think he bought a ticket, and then I didn't recognise obviously his name. And then obviously when he turned up and I heard him speak. Like everybody, they're like, oh, I know that voice, you know? So, uh, so yeah. So I, it literally was like, are you losing? And he was like, yeah. And he's like, yeah. So, <laughs> so, so yeah, he came on a class. Um, and the funniest thing, the funniest thing was we'd obviously done a bit of work together, but, um, but yeah, he came on a class and, um, and then, yeah, just, we just, you know, started working together more off the back of that. And, uh, and yeah, it was, it was just pretty natural to kind of working relationship, which was, which was quite interesting and quite fun. Um, but yeah, like painted obviously that amazing night army phase one of it that, uh, you guys have all seen, um, phase two to come, which will be great. Um, I, I, I do you know one thing that I really, really, I think from watching that video, uh, back, cause I watched a bit of it cause I just wanted to see obviously how, how it kind of went across. Um, the amount of people in the comments that were like, this guy's helped me get through something. This guy's, you know, this guy's like, it was really helped me through a difficult time. And I think that really shows how much of an impact like that Luton has had on on the industry, both in what he curates in the information he puts out, and also how much value there is in what he does. I think I think that's something that's was became even more apparent to me. Obviously, you see his videos and you see the amount of views that they get, and you see obviously the topics that he covers and the real level of interest that he puts into it. But you it was only after him coming on the show and then seeing people's feedback to the video that it made me realize actually how much of an impact that he has had on, on their lives and other people's yeah. stuff. And it's, it's really, it must've been so humbling for him to see, to see that kind of stuff. As yeah. It was well. pretty like overwhelmingly like filled the comment section. It was, was, yeah, it yeah. was pretty much just that narrative of like, Oh, great to see you and like, he's helped me so much. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is good. Cause like the hobbies, we, we talk about the sort of three pillars of the hobby, like the, the law stuff, the painting, the gaming. Um, and it is escapism for people, but I guess that's just a testament to like how important it is. Yeah. You get what I mean? Yeah, no, hundred percent. Um, yeah, let's go through some of those comments. Uh, the, the pinned comment, the number one was, uh, I've lost count of the amount of, com- <laughs> I've lost count of the amount of commenters who have said something on the lines of this man saved my life with the context of depression and so many, I like a motivation. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. yeah. And, uh, a lot of people even just responded to that comment in itself. So, yeah, I saw that. I mean, that had loads of replies to it. But yeah, um, the, but yeah. the other angle was uh, people who didn't 
didn't know what Luton looked like. It was, uh, it was all the guesses of what they thought he looked like. Some people thought Luton was a machine. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, here's one here. Uh, Trilliana Bloodwind says, finally, proof that he's not just an Admex servitor in an alcove somewhere. Yeah. Uh, but then tagged on the back of that. Thank you, Luton, for the years of amazing content uh, to make me fall in love with this universe. Uh, thank you, Siege, for bringing on such an interesting podcast. Uh, yeah. yeah. Was, that was great was, to chat it was, with. It was good having him on. Yeah. Uh, TG Story 84 says, uh, proud owner of the Hawk Shroud Knight's Army referred to at the start of the pod. Uh, it did bring a smile to my face seeing Luton's army getting published in a similar color scheme uh, so soon after, uh, especially as his video on knights that inspired the commission. So oh, that's, that's, pretty, awesome. uh, that's really interesting. Pretty, didn't realize pretty that. Pretty funny little uh, crossing good. streams there. That's great. He also says, uh, for those considering siege, could not recommend them highly enough. That's, so, uh, that's very thank kind. You that. Thank very you very kind much. Yeah, and your army was great to work on. I think, George, you mentioned it, like when they were both on the shelf together. I was so like, confused. I was, like, <laughs> I was so confused. <laughs> yeah, it's like... Obviously, yeah. we keep the job separated, but yeah, like yeah. It, at a glance, like from a distance, I'm like, wait, no, yeah. I've done that one. No, I've not done that one. Uh, and the thing as well, because like we was, there was sort of a bit of a secret for a while. And, yeah. uh, the overlap there was... It was, yeah, the timing of, of both, both Yellow Knight armies being being on the shelf at the same time was just uh, was just a complete coincidence. Yeah. But yeah, but no. Stay uh, tuned, uh, watch this space. There is a video on the Hawk Shroud army. Yes, there soon. is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I've pinned a few of these. This is the continued saga of the Warhammer calendar that we're coming up with. I, I, do you know what? I, I see, I get the notifications when people comment on the videos and I, and I, I see them come through. And I'm not going to lie, there are some that come through that are absolutely hilarious. Like you can tell that people have really been thinking hard to come up with I ideas. Like, they must have been thinking as well because it's been spanning weeks. Yeah, And yeah, some yeah. of these comments are in videos where we've not even discussed that. Yeah. <laughs> I've had a few, uh, a few like DMs on Instagram as well. Like people are like, oh, what have you thought of like this? Like Sanguinius in December. I'm like, right. So, uh, Don Hinson says, uh, Adeptus Marchanicus, okay. anyone? I, I'm take, I mentioned to you earlier, so off cam, I mentioned up earlier that I've got a burning desire to do some admech or do Just something. Okay? Stop buying Every, armies, James. Ev everything is pointing to it. This is another sign. It's another sign. So thank you for that awesome comment. I can't. I cannot stress enough that you have enough unpainted grey shame and enough armies in half states yeah, of completion. Yeah, but we all do. Do not start another army. But we do all not start an admech army. Paint one character. Right, scratch the itch. See where you're at. We we all do though, George. It's, that's the thing. That's how it, this how this how that happens, you know. So, but yeah, at that uh, Adeptus Marchanicus is. I'm. I still think March from a Crag does take the cake for for March. Yeah, being see, honest, I couldn't. But... I don't. I don't think like like Nick Baton, the 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 OG Ultramarine lover that I know, he he will not want to change March at all whatsoever. And I don't think you're going to break that break that routine. So um, it's a good one. So if you are an Admech player, then you can then you can. That's true. Segue, Maybe seg March could be split down the middle. <laughs> yeah, there if you you're a if you're a Marine player or you're into Admech. Yeah. Next one is from uh, Newt's Tabletop, who says, my suggestion for the calendar is February for Gene Steeler Colts. Long live the brood lord. Brood lord. I mean, now, I put this one, right? I'll be honest with you, right? This isn't the best I think this I've is heard. a stretch. Like, However, is... there have been no suggestions for February. No, and I'm true. scraping the bottom of the barrel at this point, James. So basically, so... we'll put that one in. Yeah. It's a placeholder. It's a placeholder. <laughs> Sorry to say it, but yeah, you need, I mean, yeah. fair play. You won the gold medal, but you are the only person who entered the race. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, that one needed a crowbar to squeeze it in, but like, it's like, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it'll do. It, in yeah. a, in similar camp, uh, Stretch3281 says, uh, has anyone done Nidvember? I mean, that's quite good, actually. Not bad. Like, it's Not quite bad. good. Nidvember, that, that's got a ring to it as well. I could, I could, I could fall into yeah. that. Well, the uh, the Warhammer calendar saga continues. We've got to get these in by the end of the year, right? Like yeah. time's time's ticking on. Yeah. So uh, I would love to formally formally get a list of every month for next year, so that we can at least talk about it in that in that episode or that month. I think that would be quite good. But um, there we go. I'm loving November. November is yeah. pretty good. All right, this is a bit of a callback to what I just said about me being bullied in uh in the cards. <laughs> This one, this is one that slipped under the radar for me. I didn't quite notice it. And I was going back curating these comments for this episode. Uh, Ab Cordova says, I have a question. Why does George continually have just the worst takes and opinions? Great painter though. Now for me, my favorite part of this is that he just threw great painter in there at the end. It's like, it's like, it's, it's, it's giving you a slap, but then, then as, as, as you slap and take the hand away, it's like a caress. That's yeah. basically what it is. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, look, Okay. Unfortunately, we do have varying opinions on the show, <laughs> and um, you know whether you choose to agree or not. That's obviously completely up to you. But um, but um, yeah, I mean, look, I did make me laugh reading that. That's I, good one. Yeah, I don't really know what to yeah. comment on that one any more than than uh, great comment. 
<laughs> yeah, my hot takes are uh, approving testing for the listeners, I think. But uh, no, I'm going to stick with it. You know, I am me. I think I think you'll you look. I think there'll be some semblance of balance eventually. So, so yeah. yeah, it's fine. Team Brown base room. I know you're out there. It's not happening. <laughs> it's not happening. Should we get into our topic for the week then? Let's do it. So one thing that I thought was interesting, we both come from a music background, right? Mm-hmm. I suppose you're not so into it as I am these days. But one thing that I follow in the sort of guitar space, which runs like obviously like completely parallel outside of our circle. I've seen this like big thing lately of people being like, oh, how do you get out of that like intermediate phase as a guitarist, which mm-hmm. I, I suppose you probably relate to somewhat from back in the day. I mean, look, I, I, you know, I can't play guitar anywhere near what I used to be able to play now. They've been in the last- I mean, I meant in the time period, right? Like you spend most, I think with any like hobby or skill or trade or profession, you spend like most of your time in this sort of grind in the middle, right? Because yeah. you've got your like beginner gains when you're like, you first start out, you're accelerating at like rapid pace of improvement. Like the first- the first model you paint compared to the second one you paint is like leaps ahead, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I feel like I certainly did spend a lot of this time in the sort of no man's land of like, I was happy with my painting and models look good, but I wasn't sure of like what to really do to take the next steps. And it kind of felt like I was just sort of treading water in terms of improvement. Like, you know, you kind of talk about that like sort of bell plateau curve, in. plateau improvement yeah. sort of thing. Um, so I thought it'd be interesting to curate our opinions on what we think you should do to go from that sort of, phase where you know you're happy and you're getting good results mm-hmm. but like what are the next steps to go from like intermediate to get yourself on the path to improvement yeah yeah so you know techniques things to implement mindset and that sort of stuff um yeah i mean there's a there's a whole there's lots of different avenues that you can take to um to to to, to get yourself out of that plateau I, I do think firmly the thing is the thing that i'll always say and that thing that always for me is it will be the biggest um I think the biggest ROI on sort of like doing it is 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 really moving away from what your day to day or week to week is of what you're painting, purely because if you do that, what it means is that you're going to be your whole mindset and approach to this this new thing that isn't the thing that you're experienced with. It kind of forces you to have to 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 learn other things or to paint a different way or paint using different colors or the shapes, the volumes, that whatever it is on the model, the details on the model. If you've collected a certain range of miniatures for a long time, you're going to be very used to the shapes and the specific details because nine out of 10 times, there's a lot of parity between one one model kit to another model kit. I guess kit that's a problem range. with like an army painting hobby, right? Mm-hmm. Is if you've just, if you've picked up an army and you only paint for yourself and you I presume generally like most people, at least for their first time when they're, especially when you're getting started in the hobby, right? Like most mainly going to be painting that one thing mm-hmm. and you do get quite skilled and proficient at doing that one thing eventually, probably yeah, like yeah. towards the end of that army project. Mm-hmm. But then when it comes to, I definitely had this, it's like I was painting Marines forever and that was like the first thing I painted and I was doing it for a long, long time and I felt pretty confident at doing it. But then the second you gave me a model that wasn't Marine, it was like I was a beginner again. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's exactly it because it because it forces almost like a mental reset on the approach and the way that you do it because it's like this new thing that has a different form, a different shape, different details, different things that you have to render on the model with the paint, and then and, and things that you have to convincingly sell as leather or armor or uh, whatever skin, flesh, all those kind of things. I think that the the more times you fluctuate and um, paint different things. Every time you do that and you paint something that is different from the day to day, like you've got your core models or core range or core army that you collect or whatever, pick in something that is so drastically different and try and execute it just as well as the stuff that you would normally do, but maybe using new colors or maybe approaching it in a different way or something like that. That's the biggest way to start making experience gains, which then directly will be transferable when you go back to your comfort zone, because that again, using the acronym that I always say, which is the word fear. So false expectations appearing real, like your false expectations of how something is going to turn out or how you're going to approach it. Or, you know, if I paint using this color that I've never used before, is it going to go on thick? Am I going to be able to dilute it correct? Am I going to be able to layer it correctly? Am I going to be able to highlight it? What colors do I highlight it with? All those kind of things. It's those questions and it's the question that drives the gain, if that makes sense. Do you think that if you're like someone who's painting a Marine army, and then you went and painted something like completely different, like insert faction here, like Gene Steelers or something. Do you think that doing that, other than making you a more well-rounded painter, do you think that you're actually going to take and learn skills that will be applicable when you do go back to those Marines? Yeah, because there'll be things on that other on those other models that once you've mastered those or once you've learned to paint those, 
there'll be things potentially on the models that you were painting before that maybe because of being forced to paint this other thing, you would never have thought of painting them in a different way or to look different, if that makes sense. Mm. So let's just take, for example, um, let's just say that you've got your Marines, they've got their belt, they maybe have a couple of pouches and stuff. And you probably, you know, you probably edge those really sharply or you, you know, you do them in a, in a standard edge, edge highlighted way. Let's just say you went and painted a range of cowboy miniatures. Yeah. Okay. So completely different. Completely out of the box. Completely out the out the out the ballpark. You know, you, you find like a Western game, okay. Um and 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 you you get yourself, they've got a lot of clothing, so that's more material. You know, they've got a lot of leather back in obviously and they use a lot of hide back in those days, obviously, for all manner of things, pouches, uh, leather trousers, all those kind of things. Like obviously you could just paint them brown, but if you because of that type of game, if you want to add like weather into the leather or scratches and damage to the leather etc or to show function of that constant moving of that leather flap on that pouch or on that on that gun holder or whatever blah blah you could then go back to your space marine and go well that pouch is leather i've just spent six months painting all my cowboy miniatures and i've rent i've rendered that all the leather on across the models to look like leather i'm now going to paint the pouches on marines as leather mm. you know rather than just painting it brown and edge highlighting it with a couple of stages chunky thin dots whatever blah blah you can then start transferring that back onto the models which means that when someone picks up that new, that model from your comfort zone they go wow that leather pouch looks like leather yeah. you know um i think that i think there's a lot of things like i i went from painting like marines and then i i i always gone about age of sigma models like i've got a couple of lumineth characters which are so different from from marines um and because of that it it you learn loads of stuff like fabric and stuff like i i was conscious that fabrics and things like that were things that I thought within my own painting was a bit weak. I was a bit weak on and didn't know how to render or paint as well as I, as maybe as other stuff that I've painted 5 million times or whatever, specifically red, but like, but, um, jumping onto those Lumineff models and painting something that's so different means that once I've painted tabards, cloths, capes, all those loincloths, all those kind of things, et cetera, on those Lumineff models, and then going back to my Marine, that's got one tiny loincloth or has got a bit of a cape or whatever. It just means that, I've kind of done the exam with yeah. the Lumineth models to then go, right, I can do this, this, because this is so much tinier. Yeah. Um, I remember like having a similar sort of experience. I painted probably back to back, maybe 15 like Space Marine armies. Like I literally spent probably two years like just basically only painting Marines. And then I did a commission for uh, an Avatar of Kane. And like I had that model in front of me and I was like, I do not know where to begin with this. But I persevered through it and I painted it. And I was just really happy with the results of that. But now I know, like when I go to paint, you know, some like uh, lava effects on a sword, or if I was going to paint some like salamanders or something, it's like you take all of those skills that I thought would be like completely irrelevant, but one day like they will come into action. Oh if you yeah, get what yeah. I mean. it, well, it's it's you know what it is. It's like you know, it's it's adding that extra tool to your to- toolbox so that when you in- when you encounter that that again in the future, rather than trying to jerry rig it with something that you've been using all the time you've got a specific tool for that it's funny that how job. you bank that information as well because like in the moment it might seem like kind of like you're never going to use it again but then yeah. surely enough in like six months 18 months like you'll be like oh i remember doing this no exactly. exactly yeah yeah um my one that i picked and the thing that i think is probably the most important if you're already sort of confident as an intermediate painter i think if you're if you're an intermediate painter and you're happy with the results you're getting but you want to improve you should do this increase the sharpness like the the physical thickness of your highlights across the board as in sharpen them like sharpen them yeah, like yeah. Go, if you're edge highlighting in space marines and you're happy edge highlighting in space marines try edge highlighting them thinner and the way that you could traditionally do that whether you want to or not is with the heavy metal style of mm-hmm. the chunky highlight thinner highlight within that that covers like 50 percent of that mm-hmm. third stage and so on yeah i think doing that and like even if you don't like the box art style, like making that jump will have valuable implementations in your painting, like across the board, regardless, because you've spoken as well about a million times about like improving your brush skill and just practicing brush strokes and whatnot. I think the edge highlighting, even if you don't want to paint in an edge highlighting style, like does just improve your brush control massively. Of course it does. Yeah. I, I've got to say this, like whether you like the heavy metal style or not, one thing that it does teach you to do is be refined mm. and refinement we always say this uh, like one on the classes that we teach and stuff on the weathering sections like when you when people first approach weathering they'll do it quite large or they'll do it quite like bear in mind that door's eight foot tall if you're doing a big exactly like that refinement actually sells 
how it makes things look more real. It's to scale, isn't it? It's the same with like, you know, little chipping and stuff on a Marine. Like if you're painting a little, a a scratch or a chip on a Space Marine leg panel and you're doing that with like an edge highlight, which is Mm -hmm. fine. But if you're doing that, the same thickness as the edge highlights on the rest of the armor, like that's why it doesn't read like quite right. Um, I think that's like a big jump. And like I said a moment ago, where like in the moment, say you say you hate painting like the box art, right? You might think, what's the point in this exercise? Like it's, it's not gonna be any useful, but that brush control and that skill of being able to paint that much sharper, you can just translate to everything across the board. Of course like you you're can. painting a face, like all of a sudden you've got this better brush control and you can start painting all of your highlights to a better scale that suits the model. That's obviously important. No, it, it, it's and like the thing is, is obviously there's loads of different styles of painting miniatures. Um, you've got a more, more sort of like a Spanish style or European style that obviously some brush strokes are, uh, brush strokes are a little more visible, for example. Um, some of the blends maybe aren't as close or whatever, blah, blah. But the, one thing that with every metal style that does or painting that super controlled, accurate, precise, refined way, it, that style massively adds to a NASA size rocket booster to your brush control. And what that directly correlates to is that when you go up to paint a 75 mil bust and you're trying to do the tiny little scratches on a bit of armor or weathering, or if you're trying to do the tiny little catch light in the eye, or if you're trying to do the like the individual hairs on an eyebrow or something like exactly. that, like it directly correlates to doing that. So uh, you, whether you like the heavy metal style or not, I still think as an exercise for, as a painter, going, right, I'm going to try and copy that as close as physically possible and get my lines. I can see how big a Primaris Marine is and I can see how fine and refined the highlights are on that part of the armor. I'm going to try and do that. Just that as an exercise, whether you like Primaris, whether you like Warhammer, whether you like Space Marines, whether you like the heavy metal style, take all of that away and strip it away purely down to the core thing, which is I'm going to try and paint as neat and as sharp and as refined and copy this like for like as best as I physically can that will then teach you a skill which is directly transferable to so many other avenues of painting away from the heavy metal style. I think as well, it's something that you could so easily and tangibly like practice and put into action like really quickly. Like now, if you're painting while you're listening to this, if you take a model, like say you you paint Space Marines and you're happy edge highlighting, like even if you're someone who likes painting the box art style, Mm -hmm. right? Say you're someone who paints in the box art style, intermediate painter, you're happy as you are. Take a model that you've painted and look at it get a new marine like a fresh one and see if you can just consciously paint it like say i'm going to do the edge highlights 50 percent thinner yeah 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 like yeah. if you literally just side by side or you know if you've never done it before paint one like as you'd be happy with then go again right i'm going to paint these every single line is going to be half as thick as the last one yeah great repetition i always say repetition is the mother of success like the more times you do something factually the better you will get at it because of practice going back to the music thing we spoke about earlier when i first when we first uh, in, my, in my bands or whatever when we first wrote a song and played it it wasn't the best time we've ever played it but then mm. as you do that that's why you have band practice you play you practice 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 until you get it super tight soup all the hits all the the uh, all the sections all the transitions from section to section. like it's exactly the same as miniature painting like you know you practice those brush strokes you practice placing the highlights in, in these in specific areas you practice the angle of attack of the brush on the surface or the angle to catch the edge or whatever like the more times you do that factually it's not an opinion it's not my opinion or george's opinion or whatever the more times you do that it will make you better and you mm-hmm. will get better at doing it. So, you know, um, I, I'd always advocate learning to paint sharp, neat, refined, smooth, because you can always dial back from that. Mm-hmm. But it's a lot harder to go the other direction and get to that point. I think if you put the work in and get to that point, you can always go, or well, today, do you know what? I'm just going to do this a bit rougher. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this in different But it's style funny though, and- because it becomes like your new norm. And like you might, it's, it's obviously going to be like really, really slow and difficult mm-hmm. to do that the first time round, But- the more times you do it over and over and over again, that becomes like your new benchmark. Like become, you're, and eventually you'll be able to do an edge highlight half as thick in the same amount of time. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, I agree yeah. completely. Um, one thing that Joe spoke about uh, when we had the discussion, obviously he's not here today, but I won't speak on his behalf, but it's something that I agreed with, was he said about stop. If you want to take it more seriously, take it more seriously in the sense of a mindset switch of if you only treat it like a hobby it probably only ever will be. Mm-hmm. Um, which is not to say that you need to go like super serious and like competitions and quit your job and sit in your cave and paint miniatures all day. <laughs> sit but in your cave. <laughs> I do I do get what you're saying in the sense of like, if you want to get better, you need to try to get better. Yeah, not I just agree. like keep it doing the same thing and expecting a different result. Because practice is important. Yeah. But you could if if you're practicing without 
thought to it and your sense of practice is just doing the same thing over and over and over again yeah that is how you hit those plateaus because you're just doing the same thing and expecting to just magically get better just by the fact of doing it over and over like you're going to get more controlled and more skilled at doing that one thing but it, if you're not diversifying that you're not going to improve it as a whole i think that's where people plateau is like people would just sort of feel a bit lost or they sit in their comfort zone do you know what it is uh, yeah it is and I, and I don't mean this in the wrong way when i say this so i want to caveat it before i we're say we're guilty of this like yeah, we've me and you i'm sure 100 like, yeah. like it's it is unfortunately like the, it's complacency of sitting within your comfort zone like and i'm i'm probably one of the most guilty people of it anyone who knows me knows me well enough knows that i paint one thing quite a lot <laughs> and the thing is it's like that is a comfort zone for me admittedly i love it whatever but it is a it is a comfort zone for me leading back to the point I made earlier about wanting to paint something different. And I've got this interest in painting like an admec model or something. But like, the thing is, is like, it, it is the complacency of sitting within that and, and not to say that people are lazy or anything at all like that. It's a case of like, I love this thing. And we are all super passionate about the factions and models and things that we collect and we play. Um, and like, if you do like, it's, it's quite normal to go, well, here's a model that I've never painted before or whatever, blah, blah, but here's this awesome model that could fits into my army perfectly. A lot of people instinctively will automatically choose the thing that they like or that they prefer because, because they, they're drawn yeah. to it more. Whereas this is where it's, it's the, it's purely a mindset thing of going, right. Okay. Well, you know, I can paint that model and it will match my army and it will look, still look good or whatever, blah, blah. blah. But if I want to improve, then going on this other path, is what's going to help me then return and be better. And I think that's the thing that you should you should understand. I think it's the thing that, you know, you should think, right, well, it's, it's, it is like going away and doing the training, if that makes sense, and yeah. then coming back. Um, but you, you mentioned competitions, and I don't want to turn this into a competition discussion too much, but what I will say is that having some kind of like summit to reach to and something that's going to make you push, I think that that whether that's a competition, whether that's a gaming day with your mates, whether that's um, you know a local uh, competition in a shop, whether that's whatever it is, you could scale that back. I guess it's just feedback in any form. Like even if you're like, say you're on the Siege Discord group, like yeah. if you throw an image in there and say like, hey, like I'm looking for some feedback, I want to improve. Yeah, like putting yourself. I know not everyone wants to put themselves up for like feedback, but like it's it's constructive. It's not in the sense of like, no, of course, you know, you want everyone to tear you down, tear you down. It's it's looking for you're blind to your own mistakes, right? Like, because you're, and I'm, I've done this as well. It's like, this is why we talk about having to take a break from a model. Yeah. When you've got something in front of you, you can't necessarily see what it is that you're missing. Mm -hmm. Whereas someone else who's got fresh eyes is probably going to spot things that you can't. That, that's the th that's the thing. When you've been looking at a model for X amount of hours, it, unfortunately, it all blurs into one a little yeah. bit too much. And, and nobody and own, nobody knows your own style like you do. No, right? exactly. So yeah. if you send someone who's like never seen your work, a, a, a photo of one of your models they're probably going to have a lot of opinions like constructively on what yeah. you could do to improve yeah. whereas if you looked at your own models you might be scratching your head thinking like i know it's not right i know it's not where i want to get to but i'm not quite sure what to do mm -hmm. um yeah. competitions are good for that i mean obviously that's probably as extreme as it gets um but i do think opening yourself up to feedback is really important yeah it is. and we always say this like you know um like feedback sometimes can often be delivered in a way in which uh, it, it, it's hard to, to kind of like translate what the person or people are saying to you. And I think whenever you receive it or whenever you see it or whatever, the first thing you should do is you should consciously separate it into two areas, which we always try and do when we give feedback, uh, whether it's in the studio or whether it's uh, to a student on a class or in any sort of tuition that we do, like we separate that into, into factual and we separate it into opinionated. Because then what that means is that if that person is tangibly more experienced than you and is and and you see them as a better painter than you, like being able to separate it into the factual side. So they're saying to me, right, okay, well, as a as a real obvious answer, well, there's a mold line there. That's a fact. That's not something you can argue with. If you've left a mold line on there, you've left a mold line. Mm -hmm. Whereas let's just say you have a red model and you um and you paint the cape green, someone might look at that and go, Yeah, you've painted it green. Um, but I would personally paint it purple because it's a harmonious color and it will still work with the red, but it just might not have such a high contrast. That's an opinionated piece of feedback. So being able to digest between those two and go, right, well, this, these are the factual things that that person is saying purely because they've seen something on the model that I can't argue with because it's either, it's either there or yeah. I've missed it or I've not painted it or uh, whatever the case may be, or there's a gap there or a bit of pin shoving or anything like that. Whereas if someone just turns around to you and says, oh yeah, the model looks great, but I, I probably would have painted this bit purple or, or red or, or blue, or I wouldn't have done that, those chevrons there, or, you know, or maybe the freehand that looks a bit big on there or whatever, blah, blah. 
that's just an opinion. And I think that you, that's the sort of thing that you do need to take with a pinch of salt and just be like, right, okay, that's, that's their opinion. That's fine. I'll take all the factual things because they're things that either I know that I've missed or left out or not done, or I've maybe put the paint on a bit thick or I've done this or whatever. And then the, the, the opinion opinions are there for you to kind of selectively choose whether you agree or not, or want to do them or not, you know? So I think that's really important being able to digest feedback because it is kind of like a language in itself yeah. when people give you it. I think separating into those two things gives you the clarity to then make informed choices i think that's one thing to be conscious of as well if someone ever asks you for feedback yeah to try and like think about it and break it down in the sense of if it is something that's just your opinion like maybe caveat that or try and yeah. like tone down your approach to doing that because yeah. if someone's reaching out to you and asking for feedback like that's not free reign to just criticize no. someone's what i say criticize doesn't mean like, you don't get the sledgehammer out you exactly know? So, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, um, um and, and also, like, if you just say that, like, they're not going to get any value out of that. No, if you're just not. saying, I don't like this because of X, it's like, okay, but you're not really giving in any direction to go in from Fe that. Feedback should always be to, if someone asks you for feedback, that means one of two things, okay? It means either that person looks up to you as a painter or sees you as a better painter than them and wants wants your opinion on it and your wants your eye on it, okay? So that's a hugely humbling thing in the first place. So I think that turning around and then hitting their model with a sledgehammer of, 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 of opinion, I think that's, it's a bit disrespectful personally in my mind and my my opinion to to when when someone asks you for feedback. So I think understanding that and, and having the caveat of saying, right, look, the feedback I'm going to give is going to be honest. It's going to be transparent. Um, but I am going to and say that I'm going to separate it into factual things. I'm looking at the model and I can see stuff. And I'm, then I'm going to say things that are my opinion. And then whether you choose to take those or not is totally up to you. But at least that way, the person receiving it, receives in it, hopefully in the best way possible. Um, and from that, they will then grow in, they, they will grow from that intermediate position that they're yeah. in into, into a more, more, more skilled and, and advanced painter. Yeah. I've always really liked that. Just a quick one. Wanted to let you know that you can get your own miniatures painted by the world-class team here at Siege Studios. We offer a variety of painting levels and services to meet your needs and budget, whether you want a centerpiece character or an entire gaming army. We offer well above the industry standard of quality and experience. You can learn more about our services and get a quote now at siegestudios.co.uk. And just for you podcast listeners, you can get 5% off your first commission with us here at Siege using the code PAINT5. Now back to the show. Um, just to circle back like off of that tangent, um, I think one thing we briefly touched on on the looting episode, you were talking about wanting to paint like different stuff, Yeah, was I think you do your kind of best work when you've got skin in the game mm -hmm. in the sense of you love Blood Angels because you love the lore and you're like, you're attached to them <laughs> yeah. emotionally. Whereas if I threw you like some random AOS model from a faction that you don't really care for, like you've not really got much investment in it. No. Whereas if you went and watched like a looting video or a law video, or you read a book or you listened to a novel on an audio book, whatever, and you got like attached to a character that might inspire you and make you want to paint it more. Yeah. So I would say that's probably one of, a, one of the good routes to go down. If you are looking for how to implement your advice that you, you said earlier on the, on this episode, I would probably go down the road of, if you're not sure like what to pick up, maybe maybe put shelve it for a minute and go on a bit of an expedition in some, you know, some YouTube lore videos from from uh, from Lutin or another channel or, you know, go and listen to one of the books or whatever, or even just paint like a different chapter. Like if you really love Marines, like paint a different chapter, yeah, like that, baby right. steps if that's how you want to do it. I, I think the best way to just get completely out of your comfort zone and, and to really sort of like just push yourself on something new is is to literally that that is 100 percent like finding out falling in love with a model or character or faction is a way of doing it definitely but i think it's not just falling in love it's just like having some sort of interest in it because no, okay. I, I know I, I know myself and i know that if you just gave me some random model from some you know board game that i've never heard of and i'm not into and i, I don't really like fantasy stuff i'm more into sci-fi and you can be fantasy like I've i've got no attachment to that I know this for myself, right? I've never liked, well, I say never liked, like I've never been that interested in uh, fantasy stuff. I've always liked sci-fi, mm -hmm. right? And then uh, last year, I decided to watch all of the Lord of the Rings movies because I hadn't seen them before. They never interested me because I was all into like Star hang, Wars hang, and that hang, sort of hang thing. Hang on a sec. You only watched Lord of the Rings last year. Let's put a pin in that. <laughs> hang on a sec. No, whoa, 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 whoa. Hang on. You only watched them last year. This is news to me, by the way. I, I, I told it, you about this. I'm sure you didn't. I, yeah, no, I hadn't seen them before. I'd seen. I couldn't believe, I'd seen I can't believe I'd, that. I'd seen Fellowship when I was a kid, and I watched the Hobbit movies when oh, they okay, were coming it's a bit out. But like, yeah. I'd never like properly given it a go. Right? Oh, okay, I didn't, fine. I didn't love fantasy stuff. But me and my girlfriend decided to watch them together, and I absolutely loved them. And now I've gone like, oh, I really want to paint some of the Middle Earth miniatures. So I know myself, right? Like, 
Whereas if you'd have just thrown me a Middle Earth miniature without me having that, like like I said, like skin in the game investment in it. I get what you're saying. I wouldn't, yeah. have, I wouldn't have put in like decent work and I wouldn't have had the motivation to do it in the first place, right? So that's why I say go down that road of like trying to get some sort of investment in something. It hasn't got to be as extreme as like going and watching like 12 hours of movies. But <laughs> even if even if you just have half an interest, like I know myself, yeah, like yeah. even if I'm just even vaguely interested or I just heard a little bit about it in like a 10 minute video, that's going to give me a massive leg up on just dropping some random model in front of me. No, correct. The thing is, and to segue back into a point that we've covered on quite nicely as well about refinement, when like in your situation, those Lord of the Rings models are tiny. No, very small. Yeah. So again, that's where it's directly transferable because you, you might be painting 28 mil, heroic scale, 30, whatever, blah, blah. And then to drop onto something that's as small as that or Napoleonics or, you know, even the, even, even the new, the Legions new Imperialis, Legion Imperialis yeah. stuff that's coming out. That's the thing know. as well, right? If This is why I said it's so, such a translatable skill, especially when you're talking about like changing scale. Yeah. Because like if you're painting a Marine and you're doing edge highlights and they they look like appropriate, like not the sharpest highlights, like the edge highlights that you've seen in the world, but like they look appropriate. When you scale that down, if you picked up an Imperialis model and you edged it in the same way, it's going to look weird. Yeah, yeah. Like it just is. <laughs> and similarly, if you picked up one of the Middle Earth models or even even one of the Citadel miniatures or whatever that's maybe like an old model where it's fine cast or one of the old metal models, like it's just a bit smaller or the detail's just a bit softer. Like that that skill is so fundamental to all of your painting. Yeah, it is, and I think yeah. edge highlighting is just such an approachable, easy thing that's so common and there's so much information on it. And there's so many tutorials on how to do it. It's so documented. Yeah. And there's so much inspiration and you can just go on the GW website and see a million like amazing painted models in that style. Yeah. Like, yeah. It just seems like the most approachable no brainer for me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I agree completely. Yeah. I think it is. Yeah. I, just purely from the point of it just teaches brush control. Yeah. Um, irrelevant of it being a technique, if it's a stylistic painting thing. I think the fact that it w works your muscle memory and brush control like super hard, that is why it's one of my favorite things. Should we do a question of the week? Let's do it. Yeah. Weekly segment. Thank you everyone for submitting your questions for question of the week. If you have a question that you would like us to answer on the show, please leave it in the comments. If you're watching on YouTube, if you are listening on any of the audio platforms, please head over to our Instagram. You can either shoot us a DM uh, or you can uh, reply to our story that we do every couple of weeks yep. uh, at Siege Studios. Uh, this week, Chris Mini Paints says, uh, question for another week. Music, podcast, Netflix, audiobook, silence, which is best for painting? I don't think it's about what is best. I think it's what distracts the least. I think for me, this varies like not even just like week to week, but like painting session to painting session. It kind of depends for me, like massively on what sort of mindset I'm in going into like starting to paint and what I'm looking to get out of that painting session. Like if I'm just going to paint because I've got like a couple of hours to kill in the evening and I just want to relax, like I'll throw Netflix on, like I'll watch like Seinfeld or some sitcom or a film that I've seen a million times, like just something for entertainment. If I'm like, this commission's due next week, like I've got to get this going. <laughs> silence or the heaviest metal music I can possibly yeah. blare into my headphones. Yeah. Like something like that. Audio books I've done where it's just been like somewhere in the middle. Like, you know, I want to get some painting done, but I'm not in a rush. Like I might do an audio book or. I, I cannot have anything visual at all whatsoever. Really? No, no. I, I, I it's not just, I, I find that I've been there watching films and a favorite scene will come up or there'll be this cliffhanger point in a film or, uh, you know, you're watching a series and you've not seen it, uh, you're watching a new series and you want your characters to survive and there's like a scene or, or whatever. Like anything visual for me is just, is just a big no, no. And I've kind of, I, I don't, I haven't done so for a long, 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 long time, but it, but I had to go through a period of weaning myself off of watching stuff while painting because it, it dilutes your attention. And mm. I think no matter what you're doing when it comes to painting, unless you're just doing something that you really couldn't give a damn about. Like, and you're just, I don't know, just, I don't know, just doing something that you don't care about the paint job or you're getting it, rushing it really quick to get it done for a game or it's a bit of scene. Like that's, I suppose that's a totally, totally, totally different kettle of fish. But, um, but I personally, um, it's either silence or an audio book. Mm. That's it. Really? Nothing else. I think it just, I think that's funny yeah. that, cause I think, I think that's a testament to just how like different everyone is I yeah, suppose yeah 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 like, and, and believe could, me it's not the uh, not everyone not, I'm, uh, that my way yeah. is not the right way at all in the slightest some people hate silence some people can't stand an audio book because they have the same things they'll be like oh yeah. what's happening in the audio book I think yeah. limiting distractions is something that I like 
one million percent agree with. Mm-hmm. One thing I used to do, I used to have my like my laptop and my computer like in front of me when I was painting, mm-hmm. and I would find that I'd end up being like replying to emails and like yeah, no, you know, doom scrolling on YouTube, whatever. <laughs> yeah. That that I'm really guilty of. But I can, one thing that I do now is like, I just have my iPad, like full screen with a YouTube video up, like in front of my painting desk and I just sort of glance my eyes up. Yeah, Like no. that I can handle. I think it just, like I said, it just depends what sort of mood you're in and how much information like you can handle. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. I mean, no, I, I, I just literally, my laptop's under my desk on like a little laptop stand underneath my painting desk and uh, I plug it into like my speakers, stick an audio book on, leave it underneath, close the lid, just let it play in. Um, yeah, and I just don't have any kind of visual distraction. Because the thing is, like, you know, you're looking at these things, you're making decisions, you're choosing colours if, you, if you've not written a list or plan before or whatever. Like, you know, if you're already doing a bit of experimental kind of painting. Like, I think, yeah, limiting visual distractions is personally, I think you'll find a better return, a better ROI on on kind of like uh, the time you're investing into painting the miniatures. Because um, that's the thing, like, for me, like, again, I always, anyone who knows me or comes on classes or whatever, that why I always go on, go on about time and stuff, like... Um, for me, that's the thing that I don't like wasting and hemorrhaging. Like I, I, I like to, if I've got an, a two hours to paint, I like to get max return for those two hours. And I think that like, if you've got visual distractions going on, you know, and this is before we talk about like things going on at home, like the doorbell going, Amazon delivering something, yeah. uh, like, you know, uh, whatever, like stop to make lunch. And, yeah, yeah. Like it, I think, it, I think all those, all those things kind of eat into it. So having something else on top of it for me is just like impersonally and it's just my opinion it's just a big no-no for me personally um so i literally just uh excommunicated every single visual distraction that i could out of out of my painting environment and repertoire like i just literally just get rid of it something audio so because i i another thing that i think that is actually works quite well for me and i've only really found this over the last couple of years is like so specifically during lockdown is when I first sort of found out that I could still get loads done and still paint to the same level and quality without being distracted. It's like even having like, uh, having a, a group chat on like with all your mates on a phone call or, uh, or even like, the, like in discord, we mentioned. See, I can't do that. That's, yeah. that's the funny thing as well. Like, like I was just saying, if I have, I've tried this, um, been in like audio channels on discord or like group, group call with some friends or whatever. That I find more distracting than anything. Really? I can oh, like okay. sit and watch a film while I paint it and I'll get loads done. No, I can't. If I'm having a conversation, for I some can't. reason, my brain can't like think of what to say to someone yeah. and listen to them and paint. Like, I, it doesn't I, work for me. I, I've, I find that I can separate, um, I can still paint with the same attention and have a conversation, but I can't paint with the same attention and have a film on. I can't. Yeah. I struggle really badly. Yeah. I really struggle badly. Um, I guess the answer to this question then is whatever, whatever works for you. Whatever works best. for you is the thing. But yeah, I, I mean, as I said, like, you know, that's just obviously two different opinionated approaches to well, it. Actually, but, no, there is one correct answer and that's to listen to episodes of Pain Perspective. That is very paint. correct. Yeah, yeah, listen to this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be curious to know, actually, if you are listening to it, if you do listen to this while you paint, like, please leave a comment because I'm actually really curious as to what people are doing while they listen yeah, to the show. Yeah, so, so if you're listening right now and you're painting, I want to know what is your painting and a question about what it is your painting for a future episode. There you go. That's yeah. the... That's the the way to obviously find out. But yeah, I think that's that's for me personally. Just yeah, no visual distractions. Yeah, interesting that. I'm surprised yeah. we've never really touched on that. No, before. we're not. No, yeah. no. Uh, hobby hack. This is our little weekly closing segment uh, where we share a quick hobby hack with you that you can implement. Yeah. Uh, this is one that I don't know how never came to me. Um, I was doing like a mini conversion at the minute. Yeah. And I needed some green stuff to fill like a, an arm joint for a marine, right? Mm-hmm. So like I've cut the arm so that I can repose it. Yep. But that means that now it doesn't fit perfectly into the yep. shoulder, right? So you've got green stuff, the rubber suit. So I'm green stuff in the suit. It's going to get covered with a shoulder pad, so it hasn't got to be like the super clean joint. I didn't realize green stuff is a fantastic glue. Because <laughs> <laughs> whenever I've sculpted stuff before, I've done it pre-attaching it to the model. Mm-hmm. But now this has opened up all these opportunities for me because I'm thinking whenever you've got like something that's got like a weak contact point or like you can't quite get it to fit right, using green stuff to help you make it stick because it's like so sticky but like it's got a lot of immediate strength like when you touch it it's not like you've got to like sit there and hold something and wait for it to glue and hope it bites and hope it doesn't break later like it's such a strong joint it's it's like a stronger version of blue tack yeah basically yeah yeah like specifically from back in the day with more og kind of metal models as you're touching them because it's smushing and filling the gaps Yeah. yeah yeah it does work it does work really well see i i i always used to pin stuff first because the thing is with i used to always pin 
first because then that way you, it, the, what would happen. I find green stuff when it cures if you do that and it cures it's very much like a hot glue gun it's great when you first try and contact something but once it dries and sets it s- snaps and breaks quite easily right uh, or comes off very easy just like a hot the glue from a glue gun if you put it on a surface it will you can peel it off quite quick and quite easy um so I used to put a pin in and pin the arm on or pin the thing on that would give me like a, a bar that's in between the two parts that you could almost like wrap like a C shape of green stuff over it. Yeah. So then it would like hold to the bar as well. Yeah. Um. But yeah, you are right. Like you can just use it as a, like a, a, as a, it's really good for like just posing models and holding it together and just tiny little bits of green stuff to, to just hold the bits together and check a pose. I mean, I've see. used it a ton for sculpting and gap filling and yeah, stuff. Yeah, I've just yeah. never like considered using it to hold something together. Yeah. You know yeah, what I mean? Really I always good. think of like, okay, I've glued it together already with plastic glue or yeah. what, you know, super yeah. glue, whatever. And then I fill a gap, but I've never thought about just <laughs> skipping the middle step and just smashing them together. Yeah. 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 Not sure how well it will hold up over time, but it's, it, it's opened up the opportunity to like, I think it'll become even, quite brittle. After yeah. Time. But I meant in the sense of like, even if it's just a temporary joint, like yeah. considering that as an option, I think is, uh, yeah, yeah. it's quite useful. Yeah. yeah I'm interested good. to see, uh, to see what happens with that because it's yeah. green stuff is, uh, it's quite a fun little, uh, fun little thing to play. Hard great. to master. But, Hard to master. But yeah. once, once you got it, it's, it's great. Yeah. It's yeah. Pretty good. Cool. Well, thank you everyone for listening to this episode of Paint Perspective. Uh, as we said, if you have a question that you want to leave for us, uh, please leave it on the video and we'll get back to you hopefully on a future episode. Um, do as well. We've been speaking about what to do while you're while you're hanging out and, and painting. Uh, consider joining the Siege Discord. Um, it is free and it's also available for patrons as well. We've got some exclusive channels over there. If you want to chat to Siege staff or just other members of the community, consider that as an option. Uh, thank you everyone. We will catch you on next week's episode. Mm-hmm.